You're watching Introducing Adaptogens by Dr. Lisa Gall on Resonance Wellness TV, part of our Whole Life Medicine Alleviate series. Keep in the loop about future webinars and events on whole-life-medicine.com. Welcome to Introducing Adaptogens. I'm glad you could be here with me on this webinar. And as usual, this presentation's given in the context of whole, the whole life medicine model. And when I'm talking about adapting to stress, we're talking about starting points in both the alleviate and align aspects of the whole life medicine model. So today we're gonna to talk about adaptogens and their role in improving your adaptability to stress. So we're gonna be looking at multiple areas where stress can have an impact and also be supported. And any weakness in the alleviate areas. So these are often things like toxicity, poor nutrition, or some other lifestyle issue that's not being supported properly can always help create more stress in body and mind. And from um, the Align perspective, it's important to look at stress patterning and condition programs in your autonomic nervous system and the body's psychoneuroendocrine immunological response, um, which is a fancy word that basically means your mind and your nervous system, your hormones and your immunity are really four sides of the same box. And that's what we often find in stressors in Align. So on the road to awareness, you can connect what you're carrying with your perception of stress. And you can always do a survey as well of events and wounds that can be in the way of your body's healing. Those can all be stressors. So surgeries, injuries, dental problems, chronic infections, physical trauma, we're going to see um, that these can play a pretty good role um, as, an, as stress increasers, really. So often you need to reconnect pathways to become more aligned and less stressed out. So we're going to talk about the adaptogenic plants today. Um, and they're ability to support both kind of the normal and also the sometimes the not so normal stressors in life. So the, the first question is, you know, what is your stress level? A stress reaction is a pretty common reaction to everyday things, everyday things like work or school or finance issues, relationship difficulties, you know, possibly worldwide pandemics, <laughs> you know, and although stress typically carries a negative connotation, not all stress is really bad. Your body's reaction to stress can really help motivate you to perform better. You know, so if you have to prepare for an upcoming job interview or an exam, or it could be life-saving in a situation where you need to react to danger, the body really prepares to face a threat um, danger by quickening your pulse, tensing your muscles, increasing your brain function to really help you with survival. The problem with stress is when you fail to recognize how much stress you're under. And um, typically, I find that that's because people confuse negative mental stress um, that you can't handle with the only thing under the category of stress. But of course, that's not true. And we can really see that prolonged stress can cause the body's hormones to become unbalanced, and that can result in illness and disease. And um, we're going to take a look today at what hormones are involved with, with stress. But first, let's just take a look at some of the stressors that you might be facing and some of the things that you might not even think of as being stressors. So at the top of the pile, um, I mean, these are just some of the stressors <laughs> we could probably put down here. By the top of the pile, you know, things like changes in your microbiome. So exposure or change in the bacterial populations or the normal viral balance, because you have viruses as part of your, of your microbiome. Most people don't realize that, but there's a number of different organisms that are really united together in a population and they are part of your normal physiology. But changes in them um, can make a big problem. So having to use antibiotics or multiple antibiotics for whatever reason, that could be a huge change and stress on the inside of your guts, every other place where you have a flora. 
There can also be chemical stressors. So exposures to toxins, pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, um, metallic toxins in an industrial way, or sometimes even in a household way. Um, cleaning agents, dusts, smoke, you know, some of the intentional ones like tobacco and pharmaceuticals. These are all stressors on your body. Even environmental stressors. And I think, you know, in Calgary, we, we live in a fairly environmentally stressful location. We have extremes of temperature often. Um, we, it's often very dry. We have a lot of exposure to radon here. We've talked about that in previous lectures. We are at relatively high altitude. We're subject to um, Chinook winds, which are, you know, a really interesting phenomenon that you only see on the lee side of a mountain range separated from an ocean. So there are conditions that actually can be quite stressful to physiological systems. We can also be, have difficulties with our nutrition, you know, either based on the food that we're eating, the quality of the food we're eating, sometimes not even realizing that the food we're eating might not be grown in the best soil. Um, sometimes we're alcohol or recreational drug users, or we eat damaged things like fried things that actually take sometimes more nutrition to deal with than they give you. There's also the physical aspects of stress. So um, I have met many people who overexercise, as an example, and it creates a huge stress around the body, especially if you don't give the body an opportunity to um, recuperate in a timely fashion. A surgery, an accident causing trauma, um, both not self-induced and self-induced starvation, um, poor oxygenation, sleep problems, a chronic illness, um, a pregnancy is a huge stressor and new parenthood is also a huge stressor or just the chronic overstimulation of modern life. You know, and that's one of the reasons why I think, you know, psychologically we see so many of our cares and concerns become major stressors and we don't do a great job, I think, as a society to help teach people how to handle them very well. Um, and last but not least, you know, people also have stressors in their spiritual lives and finding meaning and um, feeling connected. Those things are just as important. So um, even if it is not a negative, you can have many stressors in your life, like really like you getting married and moving to Bermuda, winning the lottery. Those are all, you know, equivalents to death <laughs> in a stress, from a stress perspective. And so it doesn't have to be something you're not handling. It doesn't even have to be something negative. There are multiple stressors. And of course, in recent months, we've had many stressors. Most of us have experienced a number of different stressors as a consequence of the conditions right now. And we have to be a little bit gentle with ourselves in terms of, of how much trouble that's actually creating. Now, let's take a look at the hormones of stress. So um, I was trying to find simpler diagrams than this. This is the simplest, one of the simplest ones I could find that would still kind of bring across the point. So my apologies if this makes you recoil from, you know, previous biological biology class exposure. <laughs> So stress in your body is managed by two different physiological systems. One is the HPA axis, it's shown here in blue. That stands for the hypothalamus, pituitary, and adrenal axis. And then on the other side, the in pink or in orange, is the sympathoadrenal medullary system. And that's the interface between the sympathetic nervous system and the adrenal glands. So the hypothalamus and the pituitary um, our bottom of the brain structures and the spinal cord, of course, um, you realize that comes from the base of the brain down your back and um, close to the vertebrae. And then there's the adrenal cortex and medulla. And those glands are actually on top of your kidneys um, at approximately your mid back. Um, and just tucked under right, right like where the bottom of the rib cage is. So in 
an, a perceived stress. If it's, it doesn't matter if it's real or not. Real meaning, you know, something like you have to run from the tiger or perceived in that you, you perceive a stress, something is being stressful. If your hypothalamus in your brain perceives that something is stressful, it actually starts a cascade of hormones and that's known as the stress response hormones. And what it does is it produces a number of changes that ideally is gonna allow your body to adapt and reestablish balance. So first your hypothalamus responds to stress by releasing CRH here or corticotropin releasing hormone. And that causes your pituitary to release um, adrenocorticotropic hormone. That's a hormone that travels through the blood to the cortex of the adrenal gland, and it causes it to release um, glucocorticoids and mineral corticoids. So um, the glucocorticoids include mainly cortisol, but they, it also includes DHEA and aldosterone and adrenoserone. And in addition, the hypothalamus is stimulating the adrenal medulla, that's the middle or middle layer of the adrenal, through the sympathetic nervous system, through literally through the spinal cord, encouraging it to release adrenaline and noradrenaline. So as you can see, the nervous system and the hormonal system are very closely related in this response. And so for the short term, these changes are effective. You know, it's when the stress goes on too long that we see changes in health that aren't advantageous. Given that engaging this kind of coping mechanism takes a lot of energy and it's often creating breakdown of muscle and upregulating pretty expensive pathways in your body to make more fuel to keep you going during stress. And I'm sure all of us have had the experience of being through, you know, a shocking minor stressor or a longer stressor. We're all familiar with some of the feelings of these things. Um, and we're especially worried about them if they happen out of context. And so we're going to talk about that a little bit because that's where we often see people start to perceive that something's not quite right. So let's look first at cortisol. So cortisol is um, really known as the quote unquote stress hormone. And cortisol secretion increases like I, sh I showed you in the um, diagram in response to basically any stress of the body, so physical or mental. So when it's secreted, it's stimulating the breakdown of muscle proteins. And that's really meant to increase the amount of fuel that's available for the stress. Because what you do with all those amino acids that you break out of your muscle is you make glucose out of them. That is increasing the amount of fuel for the brain over and above what you have available in that moment for glucose. It's also allowing the, re the release of fatty acids um, into muscle tissue as another fuel source. So you, you do basically a kind of um, uh, glucose synthesis from things that are not glucose. The goal being to keep the brain alive through the stress. Cortisol also um, regulates blood pressure, um, cardiovascular function, and it increases the strength of an immune response to things like infection and inflammation. So again, you know, not all of this is bad necessarily. And cortisol is supposed to be secreted in a rhythm. So it's highest in the morning and lowest in the evening. So you kind of have your uh, a 24 hour cycle with respect to cortisol. And sometimes um, you may have been in the office where we're mapping that out for you because we need to have a sense of what your cortisol curve is doing. So if the stress is too long term, um, the influence of cortisol is that, that muscles can be damaged, um, the blood pressure goes up, the cardiovascular system is under stress, the immune system actually goes from being stimulated to being depressed, and the sleep-wake cycles are disturbed. So that can, can trigger anxiety, it can trigger hypertension, hormonal imbalances in the other parts of the hormonal systems like the reproductive hormones. It can create insulin resistance and obesity, um, osteoporosis, insomnia. Um, it can contribute to polycystic ovarian syndrome. And then on the other hand, at some point you could get too little cortisol 
And that can cause inflammatory problems, depression, chronic fatigue, um, very low blood pressure, in insomnia of a different type, premenstrual syndrome aggravations, um, imp impotence in men, um, fibromyalgia, things of that nature. So what we can see is that there's too much stress response over time, and then eventually you get a depletion state. And we're going to show you this a little in a bit more detail in a moment. Now, the other hormone, um, and it's really more, and it's a neurotransmitter, but you could call it the flight hormone, cortisol being the stress, adrenaline being the flight. <laughs> so adrenaline is a neurotransmitter, and it's really creating the direct fight or flight response. You have an immediate reaction um, that creates a fight or flight response, it is adrenaline that's doing that. So if you've ever experienced a car pulling out in front of you out of nowhere, or you see like a kid about to run out in the road, that, you know, that sensation you experience is that fast onset surge of adrenaline. And it's produced in the adrenal medulla anytime that brain of yours senses danger and sends a message like that to, to those glands to create it. So adrenaline stimulates your heart to beat faster, um, the cardiovascular system is very sensitive to the presence of adrenaline. It also shunts blood flow to the muscles and to the brain so you can run. It constricts small vessels to like non-running parts of your body, like your digestion. It raises your blood pressure also, just like cortisol does, but more suddenly. It increases blood sugar and it gets you ready to escape. So... I think, though, what's very interesting about this is that there are good ways to respond to stress and then bad ways of limiting it. So let's, I'm going to show you the general adaptation model. This is um, by Canadian researcher Hans Selye. This is a very famous um, uh, theory, well, theory that really did prove to be quite accurate over time, he really described well, the stages of how um, animals at first, and then obviously humans similarly respond to stressors. And so at first, of course, on the left hand side of this diagram, we're, we're seeing what's, you know, homeostasis or good health. Um, so we're seeing, you know, good resistance, steady state line going across there. So in the alarm stage, um, so if you have like that sudden onset of stress, whatever it is, even if it is one of those sudden stressors, the body is initially responding with changes that kind of lower your resistance and they allow immediate reactions with that fight or flight response and a quick mobilization of energy. So the stressor could be threatening or it could be exhilarating. I mean, we showed the guy jumping out of the plane that is also a stressor and you would respond pretty much the same way, except obviously in that manner, you're it's self-induced. <laughs> so a person can return to normal after this type of stress, you know, especially if it's brief, even if it is something serious, but the alarm reaction can be very hard on your body if you don't really use it for anything. So if you don't have a situation to run from, having repetitive activations of that system can be pretty hard on your cardiovascular system. And it does increase your risk of heart attack or stroke. Um, and if the stressor continues, you know, the body mobilizes to try to withstand the stress and return to normal. And ideally, it would be returned to the level of the line on the left in the green box. Um, so this is the resistance stage. And if a body learns to cope efficiently, the stress might resolve. But if not, there can be kind of this continuous state of arousal, some of which we can handle, but some of which might set you up for stress-related illness. And if the stressor is ongoing or extreme, the stress can deplete the body's resources that we function at less than normal. So if you can't return to homeostasis and your body's resources aren't replenished or additional stressors occur, the body can suffer a breakdown and you can enter an exhaustion phase. So there can be high or low hormones at this stage. The brain may actually even res stop responding normally to the feedback, stress feedback, and you might not have very normal inhibition at the start of the cascade. So energy might not be re replaced nearly as fast as you use it under those conditions. And so you can see here in the bottom right corner, we're seeing like panic zone and, and burnout. And people do get into these circumstances, sometimes not even with any stressors that 
you know, the person next to them might think of as being at, you know, that bad. Um, and other times it takes somebody major, major stressors to get there because every individual is totally different. Now, if you are in the office and you do have um, worries about this, you can always ask me about like, we have several self evaluation questionnaires that you can use to evaluate your stressors and figure out just how much stress you're really stacking up. Um, because I found, you know, if you actually can sit down and look at the list of stressors, and you can identify how many of those things apply to you, it, it makes it a little bit easier to understand how you could be suffering from stress related symptoms. Um, and again, part of it is because we confuse being mentally handling those things and not mentally handling those things. And people can be under a lot of stress and be mentally handling it. And yet physiologically, they're not doing a great job of handling it. So now there's kind of different ways you can look at your stress. Obviously, we can all have acute stressors. It's the most common type of stress. It's brought on by everyday occurrences, you know, and it can be driven by past and future anticipations or pressures or demands. It can be thrilling and exciting, or it can not be. <laughs> but whatever the cause, whether it's like you have a near-death experience or you're giving a speech or you have jitters for something, you know, it's usually characterized by coming on quickly and then dissipating. But you can experience too much of this type of stress and it can really lead to a kind of exhaustion, you know, as though you were like riding a roller coaster over and over again. And so due to like too much adrenaline, you could get heart palpitations, you could get nausea, you can get chest pain, headaches, abdominal pains, and breathing difficulties. And these are very common um, symptoms that people will come into the office for and think there's something horribly wrong with them. Um, but often it's just that too much is going on and the cardiovascular system is very sensitive to the presence of these acute phase hormones and neurotransmitters. Now, of course, you can also have episodic acute stress, meaning, you know, you always seem to be living a little bit in chaos, um, always running late or rushing or experiencing a, a constant string of crises. Um, a constant worry can also be a form of episodic acute stress. And then usually when you start to get into things like this, you'll have persistent tension headaches or migraines. You can have hypertension as a result. Um, that's high blood pressure, sorry. You can have chest pains. You can even in, have difficulties with heart disease or exacerbations in heart disease. So as you can see, you know, you're starting to kind of get a little bit more severe symptoms than those experienced with acute stress. And then when you get into chronic stress, um, you know, referring mostly to like periods of unrelenting stress. So somebody who can't see their way out of a miserable situation, very bad pressures from work or a bad living situation that um, the person's having difficulty changing, um, the recognition of major childhood trauma, those things can lead to chronic stress. And a lot of the time, those pressures are internalized and they're more constant as a consequence. In fact, the most dangerous aspect of a chronic stress is that it becomes part of what you think is your natural state, even though it's creating havoc on many body systems. So all body systems can be affected by chronic stress. And if you don't treat them, it can suppress your body's immunity and that can ultimately manifest as, as all sorts of illness. So if you leave it untreated, you can cause adrenal fatigue um, and potentially more dangerous issues. So um, if we really look at it that way, the potential dangers are could be physical. And, you know, like I said before, acute stress can stimulate the immune system. That's great when you need to uh, fend off an infection. But chronic stress weakens an immune system. And sometimes people's presenting sign of too much stress will, they'll, they'll just say, I'm getting infections all the time. You know, every month I'm getting bronchitis or pneumonia two or three times a year, or um, I might, you know, might be getting sinus infections um, too repetitively. Um, and sometimes all we need to do under those conditions is actually just deal with the stress and not, you don't really need to do anything about the immunity at all. The immune system is usually fine. 
so long as you take the chronic stress off of it. Um, you can have difficulties with the reproductive system. For women, you can see irregular or heavier or more painful periods. You can see difficulties with fertility. Uh, and like I said before, increases in conditions like PCOS. In men, you can lower a man's testosterone levels. So you can see differences in sperm production, erectile dysfunction, all of those things. Um, and it's not usually your first thought that that's coming from that. <laughs> you know, or people assume some of those things are just psychological, but they aren't always, you know, sometimes you really are having a very big impact on the flow of hormones through the system. Um, the mus uh, muscles, you know, people are constantly having tense muscles from stress. And, you know, your muscles are tense like that, because the nervous system is trying to protect the body from injury. If, if it's perceiving you're under stress, it puts you into tension. Um, because in theory, if you know, somebody whacks you, you have like more defense against it. And then once the threats pass, maybe the muscles release if you relax. But if you're under constant stress, the muscles don't really give a chance to relax and recover. So you get tight muscles, joints, headaches, pains, and like over the joints, body aching. And, you know, in, in addition to the effect of losing muscle to stress induced fueling pathways, the muscle itself might just not even feel the same. And I've definitely palpated people where they literally have balls of tissue inside the muscle where it's so contract, it's been so contracted for so long that it actually takes a certain amount to even get it to be more normal. Um, chronic stress obviously can take a toll on your emotional and mental health. Um, you know, when you're under pressure, it's it's normal in a way to have a sedative like a sedating effect from some of the longer term stress hormones but if you're chronically stressed and you're producing those hormones continuously it can really create a sustained feeling of low energy and yeah and to come to the point of depression um, certainly stress can be destabilizing for various kinds of mental disorders bipolar is a great example of that We'll see lots of people who have the tendency towards bipolar or other um, uh, mental illnesses, and they'll often complain that sleep disturbances, you know, so in essence, stress gland issues um, can really set it off. And it'll create more severe mood cycling and um, heightened distraction. Um, it's certainly that true in even in cognitive functioning. So if you constantly are stressed, you're decreasing the function of your brain cells. And you can become confused or have problems with decision making or really have difficulty concentrating. It's not a permanent effect usually, but sometimes it's long lasting. And it can be from stressors many decades before that have just never been properly dealt with. Um, you can also um, see personality changes like heightened irritability or hostility or anger or aggression because you're just constantly under the influence of stress hormones. So it's like that dial is jacked up. Um, stress doesn't necessarily cause early menopause. Um, it can cause aggravations in balance, which can appear like early menopause, because you're having an impact on all of these different hormones, and they're all related to your reproductive hormones. So it isn't unusual for women under a lot of stress to show strange period timings. And especially when you're getting into a period where um, the reproductive cycle is, is getting a little bit less consistent anyways. Now, if you, um, if you think about it, there aren't too many things that you can do from a conventional drug perspective about those kinds of problems. <laughs> Actually, we have some drugs that are exactly the equivalent of making a stress reaction. Like we have EpiPens. That's like an adrenaline shot. Or we have steroids. Like we apply steroids a lot. And for various different things. And steroids um, are, in essence, very similarly structured to some of your stress hormones. So it's 
different ways of interacting with your biology. And it's one of the reasons why like long-term application of steroids to almost anything for inflammation or however you're using it can have very marked effects on how your body handles its stress long-term. And in fact, some of the side effects are in essence um, creating inhibitions that sometimes it can be very difficult for a person to naturally biologically come out of. So adaptogens are a class of healing plants that help balance and restore and protect the body by affecting aspects of the normal stress response that we've already discussed. So different adaptogens act at different places in that process. And um, we're going to, well, like, let me show you a picture actually. Let's show you a picture. So here is um, a diagram that's showing um, a response to stress that's changed by using an adaptogen. So an adaptogen basically increases the state of non-specific re resistance in stress, and it decreases the sensitivity that you have to stressors. And that results in stress protection. And it prolongs the phase of resistance. Um, so instead of exhaustion, you get a kind of higher level of equilibrium or homeostasis. And then the higher the equilibrium, the better the adaptation. So you have a stimulating and anti-fatigue effect of adaptogens that has been documented in both animal and humans uh, models. So um, for example, an adaptogen can normalize the production of hormones produced by the body in the alarm phase um, by modulating cortisol levels or restoring hypothalamic sensitivity so that less cortisol is required because you're changing that feedback control mechanism. You can reduce the level of stress reaction in the alarm phase, like prevent your body from going full-fledged into it. You can recharge the adrenal glands themselves. Um, you can use an adaptogen to improve the adaptation to stress by inducing nonspecific resistance. And so that improves your body's response um, to stress and has a normalizing effect on both the nervous system part of it and the hormonal part of it. So in exhaustion, though, the state is known as adrenal fatigue, and adaptogens can actually reverse that kind of depletion of adrenal-oriented cortisol. So each adaptogen actually has its own unique properties, and it can help with specific types of stressors. In my dispensary in the office, there's I have 21 adaptogenic herbs and formulas, like over and above that, including all sorts of adaptogens that I use for patients every day. So we're going to take a look at a few of the common ones that patients can find pretty easily and, um, and use pretty safely. So let's start with holy basil. I'm hoping everybody's heard a little bit about um, holy basil. So this is a member of the mint family. And obviously, basils are used frequently in cooking. But it's also been used as a healing plant for... Um, probably millennia. It's it's native to Asia. Um, holy basil is also known as the quote unquote incomparable one. And it's considered a sacred plant in India. So holy basil actually works to enhance bodies, the body's response to both physical and emotional stress by um, balancing stress hormones. So let's take a look at some of the specific actions for it, because what you're going to want to do is find adaptogens that describe what's going on with you a lot of the time. So, um, and again, if you ever are in, in office, you can always ask me about this because different, um, sometimes people don't know why I'm giving you a specific kind of adaptogen. And some of it is because there's more than one complaint that you have that actually fits into that category that that adaptogen treats. So holy basil as an example. So this is a, a picture um, of the full plant on the right here. It's also known as Tulsi or Sarasa in, in India. And it has some really amazing protective and adaptogenic effects. For one thing, it um, if you pre-treat with holy basil, you can actually reduce brain damage um, caused by decreased cerebral circulation. So that could happen in a stroke or happen in atherosclerosis. So you can preemptively improve 
um, how much brain damage you're going to suffer by taking this in advance. So if you're at a super high risk of stroke and you're also under stress, this might be the plant for you. It has pretty significant um, anti-stress effects. It can protect against radiation damage um, to liver cells and other cells. It lowers blood sugar levels um, very well. It can help prevent gastric ulceration and it can enhance antibody production. So basically immune stimulus while decreasing, you know, the kind of like allergic responses that people often get. Um, in Ayurvedic medicine, so that's um, Indian medicine, it's used to treat foggy brain from chronic cannabis use. So certainly we're seeing a lot more cannabis um, use in Canada in recent years. And um, it can definitely have some negative side effects. Um, and so if you're somebody who is using that for pain or um, some other complaint and you have difficulties with this, holy basil might be your plant. It also can help if cloudy thinking in menopause, especially where there's stress or um, ADHD or ADD and in concussion victims. It's actually really good for depressions from events that people just are having difficulty moving through. And like I said, it can be useful for allergies, even if it's to the internal allergens of animal dander and mold, like in the house. So it gives you kind of a sense of there's, there's an application range for holy basil um, that's quite specific. So you can make holy basil in a bunch of different ways. You can make holy basil tea. And there's some beautiful um, uh, like products that you can buy that are, are basil or telsi based. Um, and so you can make a tea. And this is because it's a kind of a, a, a very um, pliable leaf. You can use probably about a teaspoon of those leaves to about eight ounces of water and just steep them for five or 10 minutes. And you could easily, you know, have a half a cup of that three times a day. Um, and then tincture wise, um, you can use 40 to 60 drops up to three times per day. Now you could um, also eat the leaves uh, technically, but most of the time you're not gonna see this plant fresh in this country. Now you should also know, um, actually, as I'm thinking about it, it you you do want to check with me or your medical practitioner about if you're other on other medications, because um, it can interfere in the processing of medications. I mean, you're not going to be taking in a huge dose, but sometimes people take a lot of it, and as a consequence, you just want to be a bit careful. Um, all of all of the plant medicines can be very powerful. Some of them very innocuously, you know, don't really interfere with many medications, but some of the more powerful ones actually do. So um, the other thing that you could, um, the other plant that I think is a good mention is ashwagandha. So ashwagandha is also known as the strength of the stallion. <laughs> So I'm sure there's so many stallions amongst us. <laughs> so part of the reason it's called that is because it's it's a huge immune system supporter. And it also helps um, to correct hormone imbalances in stress and also in anxiety. So let's take a look at some of the main actions of ashwagandha. And you're gonna, we can contrast this here um, a little bit with... Um, you know, the, the holy basil, and you're going to see that there's different kind of pictures to each plant that we're going to discuss. And certainly I'm not, I can't discuss all 21 of the plants that I have in my dispensary, but this is going to give you a ballpark idea of what you can use it for. So ashwagandha is actually a name that refers to the smell of horse sweat. It's not the nicest smelling plant. It is a very calming adaptogen. So a lot of the adaptogens are stimulating and, you know, they're help people with exhaustion. This one is calming. So, you know, if you tend to be more on the anxious um, side of things, ashwagandha might be your plant. Um, especially if you also have kind of cloudy thinking or stress-induced insomnia, 
Neurasthenia refers to just being sensitive, like nervy, nervous. And it actually has been used clinically in protocols for cancer. Many of the adaptogens have. And you can imagine how it suits somebody better to be more calm um, for healing purposes. And so it's probably one of the reasons why it helps in cancer. Also, um, some of them have very marked effects on immunity, like we talked about. Ashwagandha is also pretty rich in iron, and it can be used if you have iron deficiency anemia. Um, and I think the classic is to take it with milk and molasses under these conditions. And it can also be used with fibromyalgia pain. Now, all these plants really can be used um, to a degree preventatively. Of course, they're not going to reverse everything that could potentially happen to you. But they certainly, if you have a particular kind of stress, can help smooth it out. Now, um, you could actually take ashwagandha internally as a powder. It's a bit of a funny tasting bitter powder, but you can actually make cookies with it. And I'm going to just actually cut and paste this recipe here for you into the chat box. So hopefully, I'm going to put it on as a sticky message here so that everybody can see it. There we go. So hopefully you can just kind of take your cursor and cut and paste that if you're thinking about making ashwagandha cookies. <laughs> and obviously you can, it's a root powder. So you're going to want to um, do what's called a decoction. So tea by decoction means that you're mildly simmering the um, root powder in water. Now, if you've never done that before, you know, but you really enjoy tea, this is, it's just, you need to, to give it a little bit of heat and processing to start to extract some of the pieces out of the root powder. You could also, like I said, eat the root powder. That's a way of skipping this. But if you're um, looking more as a tea base, decoction is a gentle simmer with the cover on um because you want the you don't want all of the water to evaporate off and if it does evaporate off usually you want to kind of bring it back up to the volume you started with to get the dose right so in this plant you're using a half a teaspoon of the root powder to eight ounces of water you're doing that gentle simmering for 10 minutes and then keeping it in the pot with the lid on steeping it for another 30. so you can see how some of these it's easier to take tinctures or it's easier to eat the powder because it actually takes quite a bit to get it out um, to use it usefully. So if you're going to bother doing it, do it properly. Otherwise, it's like you're you're not going to get very much benefit from it from it at all. And especially these ones that are roots. So you can experiment with this a little bit. It's um, it just helps you get in the habit. So another root that is often used is licorice root. Most people have heard of licorice root. It is actually the original um, licorice root that was used in licorice. And you can still find some licorice with licorice powder in it as the actual licorice. Um, but every other kind of licorice like <laughs> doesn't at this point probably doesn't contain any of this. So real licorice root has been around for centuries. It's really a powerhouse herb if, when it comes to treating adrenal fatigue. Um, and it's been shown that it can help really modify body levels of cortisol um, and really help with adrenal fatigue. It contains a compound called glycerizic acid that kind of stops the body from breaking down cortisol. So your body doesn't become as depleted during times of increased or prolonged stress because you're not breaking it down as quickly. Now, it is used in so many things. Um, licorice root is used in small amounts in a lot of traditional Chinese medicine formulas. It is really considered like a formula uniter. It's a very, very sweet in taste. It often makes other herbs more palatable. If you've ever had like licorice root tea, you know it has this very specific sweet quality to it. And um, it's just as intense, you know, intensely sweet, with whatever application you're using it in. So it's great for when your blood pressure is low. If your blood pressure is high, this is probably not going to be the herb for you because it's, um, it's something that actually does tend to increase blood pressure quite a bit. And in fact, um, in the applications where we use licorice root to um, like in higher doses for the gastrointestinal system, um, we 
we use deglycerinated licorice. So we take that glycerizic acid right out of it because sometimes we want to use it as just a demulcent for the gastrointestinal system without using it as an adaptogen. But if you also have tummy troubles and a low blood pressure, this may be your plant. It can really help you to be have your liver protected. It's, it's known to actually alleviate symptoms of poisoning um, uh, where the liver would be trying to deal with whatever toxins you're taking in. It does relieve the side effects of prednisone, which is a kind of depletion adrenal fatigue that happens because or especially orally taken steroid hormones are so similar to your own cortisol that you tend not to produce very much cortisol as a consequence. It's like an inhibition and it can make you feel very weak and depressed. And I've certainly had patients who've used higher dose um, prednisone that have really struggled with this. And some of these plants are just godsends under those conditions. It's also a really good Im immunomodulator in viral infections. So if you have an acute viral infection or even a chronic one, um, it can help your immune system be more attendant to getting rid of viral particles. So it's a, a very nice plant. And again, you can see there's differences in how you might want to um, apply it, not applicable in everybody, but if you get the right combination of things that you need to have supported, it's a really lovely herb to take. So you can also do this by decoction. Again, it's a root powder. So it's a tough root. Um, it's You could try boiling the roots. You can certainly do that, but um, decocting the powder is probably um, more efficient. So about a half a teaspoon to eight ounces of water. You did that decoction for 10 to 15 minutes and then steep for another 10 to 15 and again covered and the dose would be four ounces two times a day um, or you can do tincture 10 to 12 drops up to three times per day um, you can also take capsules of it of course um, and you know typically we're gonna probably be taking about two or three um, thousand milligram capsules again depending upon um, how, you know, how, how stressed you really are. Um, this is actually a nice route to combine with other things. And this is why people, why licorice tea is so popular. Although, like I said, the licorice tea bags that taste sweet, that are, you know, more for beverage reasons, they're probably not going to be concentrated enough to really make a huge difference for you. Um, but, but it doesn't hurt, right? <laughs> Next plant is ginseng. So lots of people have heard of ginseng. This is a slow growing root that has um, definitely been used in Asia for centuries. And it really does regulate the immune response and hormonal changes due to stress. It really does help you maintain homeostasis. And it can treat anxiety and depression and stress associated um, physiological diseases. So let's take a look at some of the things that ginseng can do for you. So it can be used in um, adrenal failure. So that means where um, Addison's disease is where your adrenal is actually not capable of producing hormones um, for, for like normal levels anymore. It's, um, it's basically the, one of the only pathologies that's uh, recognized to do with adrenals. So there's lots of functional states where the adrenal's not doing great, but it's not completely broken. But research has shown that you can use ginseng in complete adrenal failure. It's also extremely good at helping diabetics. It reduces a lot of the symptomatology of diabetes and it reduces blood glucose in diabetes. It helps with blood sugar management. It also is great at changing blood lipids for the better and it can help prevent atherosclerosis. It can be used to delay Alzheimer's progression and um, and so you would use it preventatively as an example if you know there's Alzheimer's in your family. And it can be used as an immune normalizer in cancer. Now, something you should know though about ginseng is that quality varies quite a bit on the market. This is such a popular plant. Um, so I'm just showing you um, red Korean ginseng on the side there. Sorry, I have a little typo there. It's ginseng. <laughs> That's not a special name for ginseng. So white ginseng tends to be aged quite a bit because it turns out that some of the compounds need some time to kind of like um, develop in the plant 
after harvest. Um, red ginseng is more warming and it's actually got a quite complex grading system. So a number 16 in red ginseng is the best quality. And then you'll see the numbers all the way up to 80. So 16 is the best. Um, the cure in red ginseng um, is ranked one, two, or three. And then you can also buy Korean heaven grade. That's the highest grade that you can get from Korea. <laughs> and I showed you the box here. Uh, it's just such a pretty box. You know, some of the Chinese remedies, the, the, thing, the ones that are the most revered have these incredible boxes in them. And frankly, um, you'll be probably not surprised to, to hear that the remedies, the, the traditional Chinese remedies that have penis in them, they will have like the most elaborate boxes you, you could ever see in your life. Like pretty much like you open the box and like another box or two lifts out from inside the box to present the remedy to you. It, it cracks me up every time, every time. Um, but virility and, um, and vigor over time are very um, revered by um, well, populations all over the world, but but um, the Asians have really made the remedies into an art form. It's amazing. So um, if you are shopping for ginseng, you you will want to make a note of of the quality grade of it. It's it's quite important. Now, obviously, you could use the traditional Chinese medicine forms. You could also throw it into a smoothie if you want. And look, it made this kid so young. He's practically a baby. And no, I don't um, propose giving ginseng to little kids. <laughs> but you could make um, ginseng powder in a smoothie very easily. And um, I'm going to just cut and paste another nice remedy for you or a nice um, recipe for you. Let's see if I can add, add to this one. Oh, it might not. Let me see if it'll make me edit it. See if I can do that. Oh, it might not let me edit the sticky one. I hope everybody got this one off the side. If not, you can always ask me for it later. Here is the smoothie recipe. Now, obviously, you can also, like another root powder, you can make a tea by decoction. This one's going to take quite a bit longer. Ginseng is quite hard to process. And this is one of the reasons why the quality starts to become an issue because you need to have somebody who knows what they're doing to actually get the best out of these plants. And if you're going to decoct it yourself, you're going to do it for 30 minutes and then on low in a non-metal pot. It's so an enamel pot or ceramic um, and then steeping it for 60 minutes. You can take up to 16 ounces of it per day um, once you manage to decoct it for that long. And most decoctions, just so you know, will last about a week in the fridge. So as long as it's sealed and in the fridge, you can heat it up um, again, if you prefer to have it as a tea, but if you make a big batch of decoction once a week, you can just kind of sip it throughout the course of the week. Um, that's what I'll often do with chaga. Like we talked about in the mushroom lecture, I keep chaga chunks on the stove and I just keep adding water to them until they, they basically don't give any more colored decoction. Um, and I usually decock that overnight. It's, you can, you can decock things overnight on the stove easily you don't need it over overnight with ginseng but you know a good solid hour and a half is what's going to take you um i put the tincture dose here as well and i also put down the capsule dose so a couple thousand milligrams a day um and then another very popular adaptogen is astragalus root here's another root you can kind of see a theme going here not all the adaptogens are roots, but some of the best known and longest used are um, definitely roots. So astragalus root is another essential herb in Chinese medicine. It's been used for a very long time. It is commonly known as an herb that's capable of slowing the aging processes. It also helps to support strong immunity. And um, certainly it's balancing stress hormones, helps prevent adrenal fatigue, um, it can reduce conditions related to stress. Um, it can actually reduce high blood pressure and diabetes, and it works as an anti-inflammatory. So it's also very useful if people are feeling um, kind of depleted and not great, got a great appetite. Um, it's useful if you have like cachexia 
um, which is wasting, you know, in cancer therapy. Um, it can help to reduce hot flashes and night sweats. So this might be a nice one for perimenopausally. Um, it's actually very good at preventing illness, but I wouldn't use it during the infection. A lot of the tonifying herbs are not as useful during infections as they are prior because in essence, you don't want to be tonifying the immune system when you have an infection because tonifying adaptogens by definition will decrease you know, things from being too overexcited and increase it when they're not excited enough. So sometimes you're actually stymieing the effect of the immune system by taking an herb inappropriately placed. And especially this one, astragalus, um, is great for prevention. Don't try and use it in the middle. Um, very good for um, cancer treatment and it has tumor inhibiting activity, can really help in cell repair. And it's actually a very nice heart tonic. So it's another very popular one. And it actually has a very interesting taste. And in fact, you can make um, a soup out of it. Um, and this is like, there's a couple of kind of pretty um, traditional astragalus soup recipes where, you know, you just put onion and garlic and ginger and astragalus and mushrooms usually in um, a pot together and, and basically make a soup. So I'm going to just see if I can cut and paste this recipe for you. This is one of my first forays into herbal medicine. I made a, um, a soup on the stove from traditional Chinese herbs. I used to, when I lived in uh, Washington State, when I went to medical school, I lived not very far away from a TCM dispensary. And they just had like everything you could think of. And um, because I was so curious about herbal medicine, that was one of the herb, herbal medicine was really one of the main reasons I ended up in naturopathic school. I was so fascinated with the power of plants. And I just remember like I had, I had all like the dried geckos and the scorpions and stuff because <laughs> in TCM, they also use animal remedies, but um, just amazing varieties of different um, plant medicines. And so I went and I got all these great herbs and cooked them up on the stove. And actually it made a very, very tasty soup. You know, immunologically, we had to kind of keep things on the up and up because we were working so hard. Okay, let me just put this recipe on here now so you can cut and paste it. So, yeah, I subjected my best friend to that very early in my medical school career. <laughs> but it was very tasty. So as you can see, there's quite huge differences in like some of the basic things are the same, like how they're supporting the system is very the same, but who they might apply to could be quite different. So we've just looked at a handful that could kind of have different target audiences almost. Now there's lots of different adaptogens. These are just some of the other ones that I have on hand in my dispensary. So things like American ginseng, um, which is Panax syncfolium, Am Amla or Amalaki, that's um, Indian gooseberry, very adaptogenic, Siberian ginseng, which is Eleutherococcus centicosis, um, very common in some of the formulations that um, we use on a daily basis. There's um, Tinospora, or also known as um, Gaducci, I think that's how you say it. Um, Polygonum, Gymnostema, Lyceum, Pseudostellaria, Marl Root, which is one of the very best I've ever found for pulling people out of prednisone overdose. Rhodiola, um, Shizandra, and Shadavari. Shadavari is also known as um, for the to, to help a woman handle a thousand husbands maybe it's not a thousand maybe it's a hundred <laughs> but very interesting plant um plants and of course we don't just have um these in just the leafy botanical world if you caught the mushroom lecture last time don't forget that a lot of the mushrooms are very adaptogenic as well and so it's not uncommon to see in stress formulas a combination of mushrooms and adaptogenic plants. So if you missed that, you can go back and see the replay um, on the healing properties of medicinal mushrooms. We just did that a couple months back. So it's pretty essential too that when you're, before you're gonna incorporate a lot of adaptogens, just check in with the people that are taking care of you and make sure that 
um, you know, I mean, chances are really good, good that they're not going to create a big problem, but every person's unique. And sometimes people will choose an adaptogen that just doesn't quite suit them, you know, aggravate some sort of thing that that's also a stressor for them. So amounts also vary a lot based on individual needs. Sometimes people need a lot of adaptogen to make it work, um, especially if they're under a lot of stress. And other times, like a whiff of it will really work in a person. And you can really use them in combinations with other classes of plants, like nervines, so things that keep the central nervous system calm, and nutrients that are also adaptogenic, or glandular substances, which we use a lot in the clinic, especially when people are needing a quick um, move in their energy. So hopefully I'm giving you a chance to kind of get a sense of what you might do with an adaptogen. Um, it is a huge area of herbal medicine and people are just really starting, I think, now to become more cognizant of the fact that these plants in this context exist. So um, we still have a couple more in our series before Christmas time. Um, we have anti-aging aging secrets next. So that's the end of October. And then we have eczema um, in November, which is a very common complaint. And next year, we have a couple of cool ones planned out. So sugar, inflammation, brain health, and happiness. So I'm hoping that everybody will have a chance to come and, um, and meet up with me on the last Tuesday of every month. We've been doing this now for at least a year and a half. So I think you have a big library to choose from on topics that you might be interested in. So um, I so appreciate you guys for turning up all the time and learning something new. Um, and it also gives me a chance, obviously, to share some of these things in more detail with you. So I hope you're leaving today with more knowledge that you came in with. And don't forget to reach out if you have any questions about adaptogens um, or if you want to come in and have a you know, hand-picked selection of adaptogens for you. I am more than happy to help you with that. Thanks for watching. I love to connect to my patient community to inform and inspire, and I hope you'll join us again in the near future. Don't forget to check out whole-life-medicine.com for more webinars and events.